I got a big knife, cost about four bucks. So I said, all right, I'm here, I'm here to get the money. I've got 110,000 out of that one. I ended up getting 15 years. For my own safety, they thought that housed me with the worst degenerates in Australia at the time. A robin a bank was like going down to shops to get a loaf of bread. From a young age, I had to become self-reliant. You know, I, uh, my role models in those days were people who were criminals, in particular bank robbers. I used to see working people up in the bus stop of the morning and in the, in the cold, not looking too happy, going to work, coming home in the dark. I'd never seen anything of exuberance in their lives. These bank robbers would be turning up in these $10,000 cars like within two weeks, you know what I mean, and cashed up. So that looked appealing to them. The whole lifestyle, it was sort of, you know, they'd have the flash cars, they'd have the flash furniture in the house. And, and a lot of them blokes were family men too, that had family. So they'd come home from prison, the kids are wearing, went from wearing rags to wearing all the good clothes and, you know, taken off on family holidays. And that's what I wanted. First time I ever got into trouble was for stealing cars and ended up in the notorious Derrick Boys Home, which was the subject of a 60 Minutes story for the prolific sexual and physical abuse that took place there. Sexually assaulting kids doesn't teach them anything. Sexually abusing them are representative of the system and are protected by the system. So what that did with me was just make me just resent the system and want to just square up on them more. The more crime I did, the more I was sticking my finger up at them. Derrick was a place of fear. There was so much fear going on there, you know, to the point I even escaped at one stage and um, then I got home to my, like I ran all the way back to Mount Druitt, which ain't far from there. And, um, you know, my dad was had emphysema and everything like that, and I just couldn't tell him. I just couldn't tell him because my dad was really, really frail, and I was worried, you know, to kill him. And then um, the Derrick boys home and contacted my family and said, if Russell hands himself in, we're not going to get the police involved. And they thought it was a good deal, so they drove me out there. You know, little did they know what they were driving me out to. But when it all came out in the wash, it all made sense to them. I went, okay, that was the missing piece. The piece we didn't understand, you're from a, a good home, you're a good family and everything like that. And they just didn't understand it. I was what I was. But when that's, when you know the story of the abuse came out, it, made, it all made sense to them. When I was at the Derrick Boys Home, you know, that was sort of like a college of knowledge because the, the kids from the inner city were way more advanced from us, than our, us Mount Druid kids. And so they just showed me visually how to steal a push. They said, you, you know, you screw a slide hammer, which is a dent pull up, it's a panel beam tool in the ignition, knock the ignition barrel out, and you'll see this hole and that hole and stick the screwdriver in there and you can start it. So when I first went to a push, I knew everything. I was, everything, as soon as I got it open, bang, 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 there it was, I knew what to do. My mate, he was from Mount Drill, goes, my, he was just amazed, look at you go. Like, how do you know this? I said, I learned this from the boys' home. So, you know, all Derek did was escalate my family, my, you know, my, my criminal knowledge. I got out of there, um, I'd stole a Porsche got apprehended in a big police, massive police chase and uh, went before the Bajura Children's Court in Glebe and he, uh, a judge gave me a 12 months uh, prison sentence and uh, he stipulated to be served in a, an adult prison. For my own safety, they thought that housed me a protection wing of the Long Bay uh, Central Industrial Prison that housed, you know, and all the people that couldn't associate in the general population the worst degenerates in Australia at the time. Uh, pedophiles, necrophiliacs, corrupt cops. You know, they thought it was a good idea to house me, as I was described uh, later in a report. A blonde-headed, blue-eyed boy with surfy uh, boy looks with a meek nature, so they housed me in there. On the first night, I was, um, I was sexually abused by the two convicted pedophiles. Man, I had no intentions of getting, you know, staying out of trouble. I had every intention to getting out of prison and robbing banks. You know, three months after being out of prison, I robbed my first bank. 
you know, when you go in there, the, wor- the thing you want to do is you don't want to harm anyone. You want to just get in and, you know, and be as calm as possible as you can. It's not like the movies you run in and you shoot the cameras off and you start firing bullets and belting people. And it doesn't go out like that. It's like you go in. I used to go in and say, look, I'm not here to hurt anyone. I'm here to get the money. I got money that I'd never had before, like amounts of money that I never had before, and so freely. It was just like, you know, robbing a bank was like going down to shops to get a loaf of bread. Oh, I, I'd done my first arm robbery at 22. I remember it was on a Monday, and um, my mate was working, and he had a flexi day, and we said, yeah, we'll go and rob a bank. And uh, we never had a gun. We went to like a Salvation, St Vincent de Paul store, and got just a big. I got a big knife. Cost about four bucks. And um, and I went in with that. I was the Commonwealth Bank of Gordon. I got caught for it, so I can talk about it. But um, and once again, I um, I just went in there and I and I, and I stand it. I walk through the door, and um, it's like I've done I've done skydiving and and nothing. And there's no adrenaline like. From the bank, so I walked in there, really calm. It's like here, like you know, I remember being told to, by the older blokes, look, keep them calm, you know, because if if you make someone panic by yelling and screaming, things could go wrong. Someone can get hurt, and you don't want that. And um, so I said, all right, I'm here. I'm here to get the money. Just no one be silly or anything like that. No one be silly. I'm going to be here as quick as I can. As soon as I got this money, I'm out of here. No one's going to get hurt, you know. And I and this time. I was told it was to jump the counter and get the big notes from the cupboard underneath, but I don't, I don't know, I've sort of frozen, so that I let the tellers get all the money, put it on the, on the counter, wiped it up into a bag, and on the way out I said, listen, sorry, I didn't, I, 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 I hope I haven't hurt anyone or anything like that. So I got this tag, the gentleman bank robber, because I was also apologising to people. 17,500, and that was in 1990, so, Around the equivalent of about maybe 35, 40 now. And then, um, you know, and then you've got to split that and go halves with that. And then, you know, you normally palm all the $5 notes and that out of there. Um, but, um, and then about a week later, um, two of my mates had just got out of jail and I, you know, I'd told them, I said, I robbed the bank. And they said, let's do one, let's do one. And then I went and robbed. The Commonwealth Bank at Lane Cove, and that was an interesting bank because it had a front and back entrance. You could go in through the back entrance from the car park, but the cop shop was maybe in them days 300 metres down, maybe 250 metres down the road. So what we did was we got a stolen car, drove it up the driveway, put the club lock on, and let the tyres down so they couldn't come out. And then I ran through the back door, and the boys, the other two boys, come through the front door, and um, it was an interesting one because the. When I got the security footage of it, I'm standing there with a shotgun, not even loaded, with a balaclava on and the the sign I'm standing next to said, please wait here for next available teller. So it looked, it just looked like I was in line waiting for, for um, the bank, but um, got 110,000 out of that one. And that was quite, you gotta take into mind, right? A house in Mount Drew was 25 grand in them days. So that was equivalent to four houses, you know, but with inflation, I mean, the, the equivalent of about 700 now. I reckon maybe 600 now, and then it was just on. And that was what brought us undone. The coppers, they just put us under surveillance for six months, and then they got me turning up in a nice car and motorbike and living beyond my means. And I ended up getting 15 years for a non parole period of eight years. I'd had a real serious heroin habit at the time, and I I landed back in jail and, you know, I, I really was in a bad way, you know, mentally. And, um, you know, and physically I was withdrawn from heroin. I, mean, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't keep nothing down. And people ask me, they say, you know, what's it like to withdraw from heroin? And I, you know, and I, I've had some pretty serious flus in my time, but I, nothing. But you can draw a comparison, it's like 10 times worse than the flu, the worst flu that you've ever had. Your bones are aching, your body's weak. Your mind is just so foggy and, um, you know, you can't move. And um, it took me about seven days to withdraw from the heroin and I started getting physical again. And then, um, But the problem was with that was there was no heroin to escape the trauma of the abuse and all the nightmares had returned and, um, you know, which what heroin does for me, it was suppressing those nightmares and those bad feelings. And, and this void I had in, in within me, and um, 
So um, I had to confront that and it wasn't good, so I planned to escape. And um, I decided if I was going to escape, I had to be pretty fit to do it. And, you know, once my physical, you know, ability sort of returned, I, I trained for about five months, full on, four or five months full on and, you know, carrying bugs on my shoulders. I was just crazy. I had this sort of this SAS soldier, returned soldier, who was in prison and um, he sort of, and I sort of said, look, I've got a bit of a mission. I want to do this and he goes, all right. And he just trained us to a T. Everything we needed to be for that escape, he got us ready for. The uh, SAS bloke, he was a bit of a master stroke. He said, walk up to someone with a handful of salt and throw it in their eyes and see what their reaction is. And, um, and it's funny, you know, the prisoners in prison say you could do that. So I walk up to someone, throw some handful of salt in their eyes and, and, uh, and go, what the, the fuck? And so they jump and sting. So they don't know if from bleach or acid or anything. All they knew was it stings, so they'd cover themselves up. And then I'd say, oh, mate, I'm sorry I've just done that to you, but I'm planning to escape. And they'd shake your hand, they'd go, oh, no worries, mate. It was just amazing at it how, like, some bloke could have punched me in the face for that, but when I just got that split second to say, hey, listen, man, can I just explain what I did that for? I was like, yeah, no worries, mate, give you a hug, all the best with your escape. And they were, it was so funny how they were willing to oblige. I didn't, or I would have, I could have went to punching your head in because you've just insulted me or disrespected me to, oh, mate, yeah, th thanks, I I'm glad I, I could assist. So the 12th of December 1990, I went to Campsie uh, Court. It was going to be one of those days, 34 degrees, stinking hot, you know. So we had shorts and T-shirts on and running shoes. And, yeah, it was like we were going to fucking run the 100-metre final at the Olympic Games and we were stretching up. And... Um, so the back door of the prison van comes open, like the, the copper taps me on the shoulder, like to spin around. As soon as I do that, I went bang, hang full of salt in his eyes, threw a punch at him, and then he just, the sting in the eyes from the salt just pushed him out of the way. He just, all he just knew was something in his eye, bang, stepped around him, bang out to the road. And then I could feel, as I'm running, I could feel these other blokes behind me. I didn't know if they were cops or, or, or my mates, but um, you know, and then I ran, I'm running, I went to look back at him and bang, I got cleaned up by a fence. I ran straight into this wooden fence. And then I realised the boy, you know, had two other blokes with me. So we started jumping fences and the adrenaline rush of that is like something else, like, you know, because um, all, you, all you're hearing is the sirens of the police, like all those sirens kicking off of the police cars, kicking off. So you got to know, you got to move fast. But we were just up to it, man. We were leaping fences like Superman, like, going over and over fences and you know we I reckon we pull it a good kilometer between I was like fucking I was a combination of the 100 meter sprints and the hurdles in the Olympic Games like you're going over the fences and maybe even a high jump here and there and uh, but we were prepared for it we we're like because that's how we trained we come across this bloke and um, he's painting a house and um, and I seen this old Datsun 240K, I remember, parked in the car park. And I said, is that your car? And I said, yeah. I said, look, mate, I just need your car. We've just escaped. And, um, and we told him the drill. And he spoke perfect English. And he, and he said, oh, yeah, all right. And I said, I'll even leave some money in the car for you. He came out and helped us uh, start the car and waved the was as driving off. It was a funny thing, because he was on the news that night with a neck brace on with an interpreter. So they punched me, they kicked me, and we never laid a hand on him. But anyway, good luck to him. He was just trying to get an urn somewhere. And um, we made our way to Mount Druitt, you know, and the first place I knocked the door, I knock on the door, you know, you know, the woman answered the door and said, geez, you took your time getting there. I've made the beds up for you. I've got dinner, I'm gonna cook a feed for us. And it was just amazing. My mate wasn't from that area. He goes, is this how the people are here? He was from, he was from a different area and he said, I said, mate, every door will knock on everyone will be like this. They were so accommodating because, you know, we, I had become that war hero, you know, that um, people sort of looked up to. And um, that was on a Wednesday and I, you know, and I put out a message. I said, I want a kit. And what a kit is, is like, you know, it's a bag, it's got some guns in it, balaclavas, it's got some tools to steal cars with. And within an hour, there was a knock on the door and a bloke said, oh, my old man said to give you this. And... And, you know, so um, so I went back and robbed the, one of the banks I was on remand for, and that was um, the National Australia Bank at Taramara. And um, 
So the first time I robbed that, I, um, I took a gun off the security guard, I took a 32 Browning gun off the security guard and um, anyway, he seen me walking towards him and, uh, and he went, not again. I said, no, nah, it's all good. In bank, when you do a bank robbery, you never let the tellers put the money on the, t on, on, on the counter because they used to make it look really good. They had ways so they'd put the $5 notes, the $10 notes, the 20s and all the hundreds and 50s over the top and it looked like a lot more money than it was. The big amounts of money were in a cupboard underneath the drawer. So my mate jumped over, got all the, what was on the drawer and on the way out got the, the, t uh, the tellers as well. And But I stood there talking to him and he goes, mate, I'm going to lose my job. And I said, mate, I'll look. If you need B, I'll get a view. I'll, I'll get you a reference. He's going, what? <laughs> I said, I'll give you a. Re I'll get a reference for you. You know, it was, so it was 12th of December. It wasn't, you know, it was about 13 days away from Christmas, and um, so I had his gun in my hand, and I give him his gun back. I said, I don't want you to lose your job. And he's just looking at me. He's got this gun in his hand that's loaded, but I just knew he had to get the safety off. And a 32 Browning is pretty. It takes. There's a little bit. You've got to squeeze the trigger. There's a little bit. That'll take the shoot, and I just needed two or, sec two or three seconds to disappear, and, and I was really, really fit. And um, anyway, he's looking at me, looking at his gun, and I said, Merry Christmas, and I fucking bolted. And... But I'll tell you something now about being an escapee it's, it's, it's not all beer and Skittles, you know, because it's not like you can go, like I couldn't, it's not like I could go to my mum's house for dinner. And, you know, they, they were pretty bad coppers, and they'll turn telling my mum like they turned up a few times and saying have you heard from him or whatever and my poor old mum she was such an angel and she said you know he wouldn't be like this he's got a real problem with drugs and they said yeah we've got a cure for drug drug addicts and she was thinking oh what's there some sort of scientific break for her? And, and, and and my mum said what's that and, she, and they said a bullet and um and she was just heartbroken and I ended up back in in prison for armed robberies again and so it wasn't that fun, and I say to people, being on the run, man, is, 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 is full of anxiety and stress. I realised it was a problem, but I just thought the drugs were the problem. I didn't, as a lot of people think, right? People think today, oh, I'm just going to go to rehab and stop using drugs. I'm going to work out ways to stop using drugs. And, and I always thought, because the other stuff was too deep to, to, to get in, it was too painful. And it was pretty much tucked away in a pretty hidden place with padlocks. Trauma can be a fucking, can, you know, be a slave master. When I learned about my own trauma, I realised, even though I, was ma I weren't making, you know, friends to hurt people, I was still traumatising them. and. You know, people talk about remorse and empathy and compassion. I didn't know anything about remorse and empathy and compassion at the time because none was really ever shown to me from a young age, you know what I mean? And through the boys' homes, in particular Derek, and, you know, and, the, uh, and going to prison at such a young age. So I, I couldn't be remorseful. I didn't know what it was. Being able to identify what trauma was, learning about empathy and, and having empathy and compassion for other people and what I do, so, you know, because when you're highly traumatised, you can sort of display narcissistic traits because you're that fucking distant. You're all focused about what you want and what you want to get and everything, you know, and that's sort of escapism related, you know. So, and you know, with the benefit of hindsight, I think I could have been labelled, look, looking back at some of my behaviour, it's narcissistic, there's no doubt about it. When I found my purpose in life, when I realised what I, you know, what my purpose is, and my purpose is to help survivors and help people that have been traumatised get through their trauma. People often ask me today, like I got asked a really cracker of a question the other day, and people said, do you still relate to the crimes? I relate to them, but I don't relate to the excuses. You know, I don't relate to the excuses that they make about their behaviour and everything like that, because I understand people's trauma is, is hard to deal with, but we've got to make a decision sooner or later to deal with it, you know. And I'm grateful that, you know, that I'm doing what I love doing, working with survivors of institutional abuse. And you show me a person that's got a propensity for violence. You show me a person that's a serious drug, drug addicted person, a person with suicidal ideology, and I'll show you, oh, there's a fair chance I can pinpoint there's a lot of trauma behind that, you know, and I'm the one that we prepared earlier. I'm that, that's like that cake that we prepared earlier. This is a guy, we've done a, he's done a lot of work on his trauma. We forward 10 years, 
he's out of prison, he's no longer committing offences, he's actually a productive member of society. That was what glued me back into society. That's that person I was. I wasn't this nasty, horrible person that I've been called by coppers and prison officers and, and judges. And I can pass that on to people who I'm working with as a, as a tool to deal with their trauma. But I live, by the, I live by the motto, I give more than I take, you know, and the universe, God, call it what you fucking will. People think you're a hippie when you talk like this, but it's, it works for me. Part of healing from trauma is getting your self-worth, self-belief and self-love back. And when people say that sort of thing, they're reinforcing how you're starting to feel about you or you're feeling about yourself. And they, they become investors in, from a beautiful text or whatever, they become investors in your healing.